Anyone here do the really big wedding thing? And you know you have a big wedding when the, your list of people to invite is longer than one page. Could anyone here do that? Yeah, where you, you have uh, the people bringing in the food for the wedding. You think, how much food can we possibly eat? And you squeeze in people into the church. And you're wondering, how many people can really fit in the, in the aisles? Uh, that, that's what Olivia and I did. We had the big wedding thing. Uh, it was huge, vast, amazing. It was one of the biggest days I've been part of. And yet, no matter how big my wedding was or any one of our weddings were, they don't really hold a candle to the weddings that we're reading about today in the gospel. For the weddings that we have last at most one day. And it's a big day, but it is one day. The wedding that we read of in the gospel today that's part of a wedding pro uh, way of doing weddings that could take up to a week. If you're going to take the, the time to travel, to walk across a distance, or to ride on a donkey to go see your family, you're going to, when you get there, you're going to hit it. You're going to party. You're going to really go for it. And so that's what we read of, that we read of this, this party. We're in day two, three, four of a, a, a week-long type of shindig. And Jesus has shown up, and he is there with his mother and his disciples. He has, at this point, five new disciples. This is a big enough party that he can show up with five more guests, and no one bats an eye at it. It's just kind of, bring them on in, here we go, pour them a glass of wine, and, and, and off we go. And so they're having this party and um, this, this wedding reception and they start to run out of wine. And this is uh, catastrophic. This is not just, oh, oh, man, we're going to have to drink something else now. There's no more wine. If you run out of wine at a party like this, your in-laws, the, the parents of the bride can sue the parents of the groom. And wouldn't that be a great way to start your, your marriage? Having your parents and your in-laws in court suing each other. That, that just would be, that'd be great. And, and so Mary looks at her son and gives him a nudge in the ribs and says, okay, you've got your disciples. You must be starting something. Could you, could you like do something about this? And, and he responds, why? Really, Mom? Do, is this our gig to do this? And yes, yes it is, son, so go for it. And, and so he does. He, he gets these six jugs of, of water. He tells the servants, bring these six jugs of water and fill them to the brim and fill pitchers off these jugs and bring them to the, the person who is serving. And, and, and he presents them and, and the guy goes, wow, this is, this is great. This is wonderful. Most people start out with the good stuff and then once the people are drunk, the word in Greek is drunk. There's no dancing around it. These people are drunk. And uh, once the people are drunk, then they bring out the, the cheap stuff. But you, you save the best for last. And he doesn't just have a little bit more now. It says jugs. It says six jugs. When you think jug, how big do you like jug, right? You think jug? No, no. Vat. These things are huge. If you want to get a sense of how big what the total volume here is, look at the front of your bulletin. And you see those pictures of the four 55-gallon drums? That's about right. That's about how much wine is created. Or if, if you want to compute it a little bit differently. It's just shy of 11 kegs. I mean, this dude, <laughs> Jesus has created enough wine for a good old party. Now, it is important to point out that uh, drinking at the time had a lower consequence because if you, you drove home drunk in the first century, the worst that you could do was get in an accident and fall off your donkey. And, and while that would hurt, I've never done it. I'm sure it doesn't feel good. It, it is a little bit less of a threat than, than wrecking a car. So there, there's less, it's not as big of a deal to have too much to drink. And Jesus does frown upon long-term drunkenness. If you look at like Luke 21, 34, Jesus says, don't be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with drunkenness. So this is not a condoning of drunkenness, but it is a really, really good party. And so Jesus makes a lot of wine. So what? This is the Gospel of John, and with the Gospel of John, you can't look just once. You've got to look again. You've got to look closer. And if you look closer with, with what's going on here, you start to hear echoes of some other things that have been said in the past. Like in Genesis 49, when the, the future of the 12 tribes is being described, he talks about how Judah 
How the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and the obedience of people is his. Binding his foal to vine, to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washes his garments in wine, and his robe in the blood of grapes. Jesus is of the tribe of Judah, and the future of Judah is, is to rule. To the kings will come from the, the line of Judah, and you will know that they are going to be kings because there will be so much wine that they could wash their garments in wine. Well, 200 gallons of wine? Yep, that, that seems like enough. You read things like Amos 9, 13 to 14. This is one of the earliest written descriptions we have of the kingdom of God of heaven. And the way it describes it is as a, a, ty, a, a holy mountain. The, the time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall overtake the one who reaps, and the treader of grapes the one who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all of the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. And so if you want to talk about the kingdom of God, you start talking about a mountain with so much wine being grown and made on it that the, just the hills themselves are just dripping with wine. And then we read more in Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah talks about how on this mountain, the mountain that Amos had spoken of, the Lord of hosts will make for his people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples. He will swallow up death forever. And so, if you were talking about someone from the lineage of Judah who produces an amazingly large amount of wine, and not just any type of wine, but really, really good wine, aged, clear wine, who then is the one who conquers death. Well, that's a little bit more, isn't it? Jesus is not just making a whole lot of wine. This is a sign of something greater. It's a some sign of something more. These type of events in the Gospel of John, they're called signs for they point to something more than themselves. And the, the story of the Gospel of John again and again, the, the plot of the Gospel of John is Jesus does a sign. He makes something happen and then the people see it. And the question is, do they see do they understand? Do, do they get it? The, the disciples see him create this much wine and, it, and the, it tells us that they believed because of what they saw. And then Nicodemus sees what Jesus does and, and will he believe? And the Samaritan woman sees what Jesus does and will she believe? Again and again the question is in, in the Gospel of John is the people who see the signs of Jesus, will they believe? That's how the Gospel of John understands how people come to faith. It, we hear this at the end of the Gospel of John, how it tells us Jesus did many other signs and, and were not written down, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that through believing you may have life. And so these signs, the Gospel of John is, is constructed around these signs. The first 12 chapters are constructed around a series of seven signs. The, the, there's the wedding at Cana, the healing of the official son, the healing of the man at the pool at Bethsaida, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, the healing of the um, man born blind, and the raising of Lazarus. You got those lists on a sheet of paper that you should have got when you came in, a little quarter sheet of paper. Stick that in the front of your Bible, in the front of the Gospel of John. Because that's how the first chunk of the Gospel of John is put together. There are seven signs to show you who Jesus is. And that number seven, that should mean something. How many days did it take God to create the world? Seven. What's the number seven in, in the scriptures is the, is the number of completion. And so this is the complete set right here. You got these seven signs. This is all you got to know. This is the complete set of data on who Jesus is. And if you look at these signs and you see them, you know who Jesus is. And, and when you look at these signs, each one of these signs resonates with something that has gone before. Just like with uh, how Jesus creates wine, and it's not just he's creating wine for the heck of it. He's creating wine, and you hear descriptions of the kingdom of God. All of those signs resonate with, with something in the past of, 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 
of uh, the Jewish faith, the Jewish people. And so Jesus is not doing anything new. Jesus is doing things that are very ancient. When you see what Jesus does, the response is to then to look again and see that's what King David did. That's what Elijah talked about. That's what the prophet Isaiah looked to. And so again and again we see these signs and then we look back and we look at them again and say, wait a minute, that's what God has done in the past and that's what God is doing again right here. You've got to look again and see what's happening here. And as you see the abundance of the kingdom of God and the feeding of the 5,000 and in the wine, we see the healing and wholeness which is possible in the kingdom of God when we see the son healed, we see the man given sight, we see the power of God and the, and the Jesus walks on water and, and Jesus has power over life and death itself. That, that's what we begin to see as we look at these seven signs. And once we have these seven signs, once we've looked at them and, and looked again and see how they show us who Jesus is, then we're ready to go and see the most important point of the gospel, the crucifixion and resurrection. We see how that changes everything. That We are ready to see the mystery of forgiveness there. And then on the other side of that, there is one more sign that the Gospel of John gives us. And it's the sign uh, uh, where Jesus goes and, and he, he tells the disciples to throw out your nets one more time. And they haul up, haul, haul up these, these fish and they have this vast feast. And it's the eighth sign. And, and so if seven is the number of completion, what's the eighth the eighth is the start of something new. It's another set. And so after the resurrection, the disciples have this sign to show them what you're about to start, the church. You start with abundance. You start with many. You start with a feast. You start by not just ha having enough fish for a meal. You start with 152 fish that almost break the net. When we take this set of of signs from the Gospel of John. And, and we ask, what do they form us? How do they shape us? What, why do they matter today? You could take any one of them and get down in, into the details of them. And that, that's fun. I mean, you can get down with this one. Uh, Jesus takes these jugs that are used to cleanse people. And people are used to using them to mark themselves as pure and, and, and holy. And now Jesus is using them to throw a party. Now that, that would kind of mess with people, don't you think? That, that would kind of shake up their world. And you can get, with each of these signs, you can get down into the details and kind of focus on those. But, but if you take a step back and you look at all of them, together. What do they start to do for us today? And what I think starts to happen is once we see what these signs show us, we start to see what is possible. Because once we see that it is possible to live in abundance, Jesus fed 5,000. Well, then we can start to believe that when we gather, there will be abundance. When we see that Jesus brought healing and health and wholeness we start to be able to see, yes, there's a possibility that we can have that healing and health and wholeness. When we see that Jesus has power over death, then we can pray knowing that there's a possibility that when our loved ones are sick, that our Lord has power over that life and over that death as well. And, and once we start seeing these signs and we start saying, yes, these things are possible, not only are they possible, but they are promised. Because while they're possible today, they are promised in the kingdom to come. We have abundance now when we gather, and there will be abundance in the kingdom of come. There is healing now, and there will certainly be healing in the kingdom of come. There will be, in the kingdom to come, death will have been defeated, and life will have triumphed. And that is the possibility and the promise we see with these signs. We start to see what type of people are we, what do we expect, based upon what Jesus has done. And when we start to get together and talk about possibilities and talking about promise, the word that comes to mind for me is hope. We are people of hope. We are people who look towards the future and have an audacious and bold and committed hope. A hope that is stubborn. A hope that does not ignore that there are problems. But fundamentally, to be a Christian is to be a person that is stubbornly, committedly, and doggedly hopeful. We look to the future and we have confidence in the possibilities to come. And so if we are people with hope, I'll tell you the thing that zaps, saps, and destroys hope the most. Cynicism and despair. 
You ever wake up and have a little bit of cynicism and despair in your life? Cynicism, that sense of, eh, it's not going to work. Or despair. You know, it used to be good. It's not bad today, but it's never going to be as good as it was. It's never going to get better. You ever see cynicism or despair in the mirror? Or when you're gathered with other people? Or even, God forbid, at a church meeting? It happens, doesn't it? Cynicism and despair. I have become convinced in my reading of scriptures, in my prayer, in my service to the church, that as people of hope, one of the greatest challenges we face is cynicism and despair. And if we're going to, to grapple with this, I think we need to. Because uh, I don't think there is a place in the life of a Christian for cynicism and despair. I think it is something that we need to repent of and, and cast from ourselves if it is something that we harbor in our lives. For if, the gospel, if we have a gospel of hope, cynicism and despair are against the gospel. They are anti-gospel. They are even anti-Christ. They are opposite everything that we see of when we see what is possible in Jesus. And so if we are going to grapple with cynicism and despair, how do you do that? Why don't you, Andy, why don't you ask for something easy, right? Cynicism and despair, it's not an easy process, but it can be done. And I think it begins by reading our Bibles in a certain way. I think it begins by reading our Bibles looking for those possibilities and promises. Look at the problems that come up in Scripture. The Jews are enslaved. They have no land. They have nothing. They are not a people. Then, then they do have a land, and they are a people. And, and they, they are lost, and they are scattered, and, and they just can't keep their act together, and then they have a king. And, and they go into exile because they have strayed so far, and then they are brought back. And, and they just stray far from God, and the prophets haul them back by the nose sometimes, but haul them back nonetheless. If you look at the problems in Scripture, they are honest, and if you look at God's solutions... You see hope there, again and again and again. If you read through scriptures, you see the stubborn hope of God. And so after we read scripture and after we see the way that God's hope triumphs each and every time, then we pray. And we pray that that hope might start to suffuse our lives such that it pushes out the cynicism and we cynicism and despair and that we might learn to be hopeful, that we might learn to look at the possibilities, that we, we might learn to see what is amazing and possible and potential. And so that when we gather, we are not cynical about families or people or future or the church, and instead we can see what God's will is. And, and finally, if we're going to grapple with cynicism and despair, there's one more thing I think we need. I think we need help because no one of us can do this alone, right? And so when you're gathered together, when we're gathered together and someone says something cynical or despairing, there's something you can say. It goes like this. My friend, that was kind of cynical. We're people of hope. Can you say that after me? My friend. That was kind of cynical. We are people of hope. You think you could say that? Maybe. That does sound kind of preachery, doesn't it? I could say that and get away with it. What could you say? Figure, figure it out. Man, that was kind of a bummer. We follow Jesus. Man, that, that's kind of a downer. We're people of hope. We can do better. Not because we're all that, but because God is. My friends, let us learn together to be people of hope. That these signs, that we see the signs of what Jesus does, that we, we are fo formed by them so that we are utterly sure of what God is possible of doing. We are utterly committed to, the, to making that happen in our lives today and relying on God's promises that they will happen in the future. And that through time with scripture, time in prayer, time when with the help of each other, that we might learn to cast out cynicism and despair in our lives and embrace a future full of possibilities because of, because of who we follow. Amen.